Hello, old dogs. This is your host and top dog, Bill Manicero. I hope you're having a blessed holiday and are getting ready for an amazing new year. Today's show is a special rebroadcast of one of our most popular episodes. I'm introducing the show under the banner, Best of Old Dogs REI Network Podcast. Well, enjoy. This episode of the Old Dogs REI Network is brought to you by Mino Studio. In a world where jobs are how most people make money, one man, one desire, one challenge dares to break the mold. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where we don't work for money. Money works for us. Coming soon, viewer discretion advised. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network, where cash flow is king. Real estate investing, the means, so you can enjoy your retirement dreams. This is the show where we cut right to the chase. No sales pitch, no long monologues, just simple how-to real estate investing advice, so you can earn the passive income you need to enjoy your retirement today. And now, your host and chief old dog, Bill Manacero. Welcome to the Old Dogs REI Network. I'm your host, Bill Manacero, and this is a show where 50 plusers and anyone else who wants to join us get solid, no sales pitch real estate investing advice to help generate real cash flow. This podcast airs twice weekly on Mondays and Fridays, and if you aren't already a subscriber, go to iTunes, type in Old Dog, spelled D A W G, find our podcast, and subscribe got a great show for you today. Uh, I am uh, I'm real excited. This is kind of like the old dogs meet old capital. So this is going to be a real old show for you guys. Uh, um, <laughs> I've got uh, both of the hosts of the real popular uh, podcast for anybody that's in multifamily called uh, Old uh, Capital Podcast. And uh, both Michael Becker and Paul Peebles are uh, on, on call with me today. And we're going to be talking about uh, loans uh, for multifamilies. And uh, uh, if you recognize the name uh, Michael Becker, that's because he was on episode 002 uh, entitled How to Acquire 3,000 Units in 36 Months. Uh, uh, he was uh, on that podcast really uh, talking about his multifamily uh, in real estate investing. Uh, this time he's putting on his banker's hat and uh, he's going to be uh, helping us uh, take a look at uh, banking and uh, everything that you need to know as you start moving toward acquiring a large multifamily. So let me first uh, give you a little background on each. Uh, Michael Becker, he has uh, two roles. He's affiliated with Old Capital Lending as a senior director of mortgage origination and a principal at SPI Advisory LLC, um, which is the investing arm. Uh, SPI Advisory owns and manages over 3,000 apartment units in Texas. Michael heads SPI's Frisco, uh, Texas office office where he oversees all aspects of property operations including asset management property management oversight, accounting, taxation, capital improvement, and renovation projects and investor relations. Uh, Mike is a 15-year veteran commercial real estate banker and has originated and managed numerous portfolios of permanent and bridge loans in all major asset classes. Over the last five years of his banking tenure, Michael focused exclusively on multifamily properties where he was the number one loan producer for his division and a top three national lender for his th for the last three consecutive years. He's a lifelong resident of North Texas and a graduate of University of North Texas with a BBA in finance. He is married and has two children. Paul Peebles has been arranging uh, real estate financing for borrowers and institutional clients since 1987. As the national underwriter at Old Capital, Paul underwrites and structures all transactions handled by Old Capital through an array of sources, including conduits, banks, life companies, 
Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, HUD, and private money lenders. His knowledge of the capital markets and his long-term and deep relationships with the decision makers at the various capital sources is a competitive advantage for the client. He has closed over a billion dollars in real estate transactions. Paul is a deal maker. Prior to Old Capital, he was affiliated with Merrill Lynch Capital Markets, World Savings Bank, and ITT Commercial Real Estate. He is a graduate of the University of Iowa. He is originally from Western Springs, Illinois, is married, and has one daughter. Well, welcome, guys. We're really glad to have you here. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Bill. Thanks, Bill. Yeah, this is this is uh, exciting stuff. I feel like uh, you know I'm I'm uh, listening here to, to old capital, and uh, <laughs> except I get to ask questions, which is really neat. Um, sure. Yeah, we're, you know this is a a, a big area. Uh, you know the, our audience, uh, we have folks that are in their fifties all the way up to uh, way past that, and some are approaching retirement and concerned, and uh, uh, you know looking to create uh, some sort of a cash flow base for them uh, in their retirement. Uh, they're also looking at uh, creating a legacy for their children that they can leave. Multifamily appeal to a lot of our listeners. Uh, we have a, a huge contingency in California, and many of those folks are already investing in, in Texas. So we just wanted to take a look at just the the loan process. Uh, I, I don't want to go into the details of uh, it so much as take a look at what people need to be aware of as they approach this stage. Uh, you have some that may be starting out in smaller multis and, you know, they're looking to acquire apartments that may have uh, 100, 200, 300 units. And uh, so I'm, I'm just going to explore that a little bit with you and, you know, what people have to be aware of. Um, you are the guys that look at the the applicants um, for these loans. So your insight's going to be fantastic uh, for our listeners. First off, I just want to kind of ask here, um, in looking at a prospective borrower, what are the top three to five things that, that you look for right off the bat? And, uh, you know, if you can, kind of name them in order of importance uh, when, when considering a commercial loan. Mike? Uh, yeah, there, there's um, several factors when you're looking for a commercial loan. So let me just kind of start off first, Bill, that when you um, – when most people get loans or everyone's pretty familiar with getting like a Fannie Mae loan for a single family uh, rental house or their, their homestead. Um, and when you go into that process, the majority of the credit decision is based off of the, the borrower and their ability to repay and like their income stream. So like their job or other investment income. But when you're looking at a commercial real estate loan and apartment specifically, it's, it's the opposite. And the majority of the decisions uh, first based around, the, the property and then kind of secondarily who is a sponsor behind behind the, the loan. So I kind of want to make sure I put that out there first. Um, so first and foremost, what the lenders are looking for, just kind of durability of income and how they can get their money back. So they look at, you know, when you, when you buy an apartment complex, it's kind of like buying a little mini business. And so they're going to look at the, the income that it produces, the expenses it requires to, um, to operate. And then kind of uh, when you take your income, less your expenses, you get what's called net operating income. And then they look at that compared to the amount of debt they're going to loan to you. And what they typically want is your your net operating income to be about 125 percent of what your your uh, debt payment is going to be. So what, what we refer to as debt coverage ratio or DSC or DSCR, you just kind of jargon. So what they want is a 1.25 percent debt coverage ratio. So kind of first and foremost, that's what they look at. And then kind of secondarily, they look at the quality quality of the asset. Is there any deferred maintenance? Um, you know, kind of what's your business plan? Are you going to buy this deal and it's working perfectly? And you just kind of, you know, buy it, put some loan on it and just kind of yield, kind of what we call a yield play. Or is this more like a value play where the property is a little bit more distressed, has some deferred maintenance, and you're going to come in and put some capital into the into the property, upgrade um, the units to cure any deferred maintenance, raise the rental rates up, and by extension, try to raise the value. And then finally, what they look at is kind of what the, who is the sponsor by behind it in the sponsorship team and what kind of uh, net worth and liquidity they have um, going into the deal and what it's going to look like after they close on the loan, as well as their track record and experience. Um, so those are those are kind of the things when we're, we're assessing a potential loan transaction is like, well, how do we put the pieces of the puzzle together? And those are the main things that we look at. Yeah. And if you don't have multifamily experience in the past, because you've never bought uh 
a 10 or a 15 or a 200 unit apartment building, I don't think I have too much of a problem. But going back to Michael's third point, two big things I look for in the lending side is liquidity, how much cash that you have uh, in, in liquidity. And that's not uh, IRAs or 401ks, but liquidity, stocks, bonds, cash that's in your name uh, solely. And I'm also looking for net worth, just like Michael said. I'm looking for you know assets versus liabilities. Exactly what do you have for a net worth? And probably the biggest thing is, like Michael said, too, is what's your pro forma look like? What's your game plan? What's your business plan? What are you going to do with this asset? How are you going to improve it? What are the things are you going to have to cure that have, that's been deficient on the property? Is it, a new, is it a management play that just needs to be turned, which you know we do have some properties that have need new, fresh blood management on the property, or is it uh, just a different clientele base because... You know, the property has been, uh, you know, misguided. You know, the money hasn't been thrown at it. At it, as people listen to our podcast, I'm a big believer in putting money back into the property. Don't, don't do not use it as an ATM machine solely. You know, it just can't take, continue to take money out of the deal and put it in your pocket. You got to put money back into the property itself. These properties are like bodies. They have to have, be, you know, firm, uh, uh, continue to be. Uh, fed all the time by putting new capital improvements to the property. So what, really, what's your, what's your game plan from today, you know, six months from now, a year from now? What are you going to put put your money into the property? We're a big believer in putting, if it is a rehab property, putting the money up front into fixing these, these uh, you know, the deferred maintenance or putting in new interiors or updating the exterior of the property, maybe putting some amenities into the property. Don't do it out of cash flow. That That is not a good idea. Put the best product at the best price on the street up front. You get the best, you know, client, which is, is your tenants on the property. You know, make, make sure that, uh, uh, you know, you put good management in. And we're also a big believer, you know, you could – manage the asset yourself, but we're also a big believer in in having a, a third-party property management company in, uh, to oversee the property. And these properties that maybe 25 or 30 or 40 units, that, that's already a line item of expense that we already factor in a property management company. So that's already added into the expenses. That, it's not something that you think you're losing money by having a property management company in there. It's already added into the expense structure of how the property is, is run. Great. Uh, and, and you mentioned uh, uh, the loan uh, as far as improvements and uh, upgrades. Let's say it is a value-add deal. Um, your loan would typically include the uh, the construction uh, and, and rehab amounts uh, necessary? Yeah, typically we can. So you know, whether it's a bank transaction or possibly a Fannie Mae transaction, uh, but if it's a bank transaction, we'll take, we typically will take the acquisition price, so whatever that is, and we'll add the rehab dollars into it. So if it's a $900,000 acquisition price and it's $100,000 worth of rehab to improve the property, you know, a new paint scheme, new fixtures in the property, you know, new uh, parking lot, uh, new uh, vinyl plank flooring on the property, 100000 So our all-in price is a million dollars on that. And we'll typically, uh, if you're, this is your first deal or two, we'll probably do it uh, 75% leverage, 70 to 75% leverage in the deal. So you'd be looking to put down 25 to 30%. But we're going to include that rehab piece into the transaction. Any more to add to that, Mike? No, I think that's uh, that, that pretty much covers it. For clarification for our listeners, too, when you say whether it's a bank or a Fannie Mae transaction, just clarify what that means. Mike? Yeah, so um, like like I mentioned when I started out, Fannie Mae is you know Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac are the, not only the largest lenders for single family homes, they're also the largest lender in the multifamily space as well. Um, so so they'll they'll loan money um, on properties, but they what they look for are stabilized properties to experienced uh, borrowers, people with previous multifamily ownership experience. So as you're you know, if you have a property that's kind of broken that needs a lot of renovations or isn't stabilized, maybe you're like 80% occupancy and the market overall is 95% occupancy and there's a management issue or physical issue you got to cure, th- those types of products, are, those types of uh, properties typically require like a, a bank loan, which would be like your regional banks, your community bank loans, um, and then the stabilized properties that are, you know, clean and working well to experience principles primarily go into the Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac uh, pool. Um, you also mentioned uh, both of you uh, the net worth uh, uh, aspect, and um, are you looking at one person uh, on that team, or, or uh, uh, the borrower, or a sponsor? Uh, do you, or do you look like 
com- look at combined net worth of individuals. Let's say you, uh, you're going to purchase a building for $5 million. Um, what, what kind of net worth would you want uh, from that individual or combination of individuals? So gen- generally speaking, most of these uh, larger apartment buildings are, are bought uh, by syndication, which I, I believe you spoke about in the, on previous episodes. But what uh, syndication means is, uh, say, say when, when I go out and buy a property bill, you know, I'm the, the lead in the deal or sponsor of the deal. And so I'll go out and secure the property, identify it, secure it, get it tied up, get it on the contract. And then I'll go out and syndicate my equity, which means I'm going to go out to my friends and family and try to raise capital. Um, you know, a hundred thousand dollars at a time. So if I need a million dollars, I'll get my, myself and I and my friends. We each put in a hundred thousand dollars, and then we have you know our million dollars to go buy the deal. Um, and so when you're looking at uh, when the banks are looking at the loans, they they typically want uh, you know the 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 KP or key principles, what is a Fannie Mae term or on the bank side is called a loan guarantor, uh, to have net worth equal to or greater than the loan amount. So so if I have a four million dollar loan, I need four million dollar net worth. So if I don't have that all on my own. Uh, it, I could go get you and Paul. We collectively together, as long as we're in, in aggregate, we have that four million dollar net worth. The bank is comfortable with it. So you don't have to have all the resources yourself to do these deals. Most people, you know, simply you just can't buy you know these large large deals on your own. Most people just don't have that kind of net worth. So it's it's a, a group effort. It's a team sport, as we like to say. Um, so it's definitely in aggregate. It's good to know. That's great. Um, so you put much weight on comparative sales of other similar sized properties uh, in the area? Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's good. That's, that's a yeah. good straight so answer. In sing- yeah. In, in single family lending, uh, like when you bought your house, uh, we use comparative market analysis on that one. So a three bedroom home with the two bath in, in around your, your neighborhood, that's a comparative market analysis. That, you know, if it's worth $400,000, uh, your neighbor's house, your, your property may be worth $400,000 if the whole neighborhood is selling for $400,000. In the multifamily space, we don't look at it so much with the, the sales prices. We use kind of what's called the income approach. The income approach is based on the net operating income of the property. So what we do is we take now, I'm going to get a little technical here. We take the net, we take the operating income, which is your rents, a form of rents, whether it is uh, administrative rents, uh, utility billbacks, uh, you know, vending machines, laundry machines, anything that comes into uh, operating income. We subtract out the operating expenses, whether it is property taxes and insurance, repairs and maintenance, and uh, you know a list of about five or six different, ten different things, line items for expenses that keep this property going. Uh, and that we we subtract the income versus the expenses, then I have a net operating income, and it's that net operating income determines pretty much what the value is of the property. Uh, and then we we do a comparison, what's called a cap rate, a cap rate. And the cap rate is is determined by the market itself. It's determined by appraisers. It's determined by sales in the area of what similar uh, properties of, of age and amenity structure have sold for in that area. Uh, and that, that that's how we develop a cap rate. And then based on the cap rate and that NOI, that equates out to a value. And that's really where we come with with the value. So the way we formulate uh, valuation on an apartment complex is different from single family. That's one thing that you have to kind of uh, communicate to your to your uh, ownership groups is that it's not the same. But you know, NOI is, is the most important thing. So we if we can increase the NOI up by saying ten dollars, they'll have a direct impact to the bottom line or the valuation of the property. Anything more to add to that, Mike? Uh, no, I think you did a good job. The formula for valuation is, uh, you know, with the factors you gave, NOI and cap rate, uh, how would somebody calculate that uh, on their own? Uh, it's simply just taking the, uh, like, like Paul said, you take your, your operating income minus your operating expenses like uh, property taxes, payroll, repairs of maintenance, et cetera, uh, which excludes your debt service payment. So it doesn't have interest expense. So just your income less your, your operating expenses, it gets your net operating income or NOI. You take that divided by your capitalization rate or also referred to as cap rate. So if you have, um, for example, if you have $300,000 in net operating income and you have $200,000 in operating expenses, I'm sorry, yeah, operating expenses, you get net operating income of 100000 And if it's a 10 cap or you divide it by uh, 0.1 or 10 
ten percent, so a hundred thousand divided by point one would equal a million dollars. So if you want a, a, a unleveraged return of ten percent, um, and it produced a net operating income of a hundred thousand, you'd be willing someone would be willing to pay a um, million dollars for that for that property. If that makes sense. That does. And just to clarify on the cap rate, is it the cap rate of that uh, that area? In other words, what other properties are selling? At? What's the cap rate uh, of other properties? Or is it the cap rate of that particular property? Yeah, so it's cap rates uh, driven, like Paul mentioned, it's driven by the market. So okay, so it's a market. Other, whatever, yeah, whatever the other uh, similar properties in the market of similar locations and similar vintage, that is what um, sets kind of the market cap rate. Gotcha. Great. So, so we're we're in the center of the universe when it comes to uh, apartments in in Texas, and especially Dallas Fort Worth, where we're physically located at. And so, cap rates in this marketplace, depending on the age of the asset itself, and the amenities of the property, and the condition of the asset, may be anywhere from seven or so down to if it's a nicer, newer property that's just coming to be built, is it probably five, a five, a five cap? Where, let's say in California, we probably start off at a five or a five and a half or six and then get all the way down to, say, a three, three and a half. What you have is a, you get a bigger bang for your buck in Texas than you would in, say, Southern California or even the, the Bay Area for similar conditions, similar age property on the deal. And that's why we, we have so many investors coming to, to Texas just because of, say, jobs and the amount of, of uh, properties that are available to, to purchase in, in the state of Texas. Now, I've heard of people you know, getting cap rates of like 10% in Texas. Is, uh, are those uh, maybe lesser, uh, maybe Class C-type buildings or um, in less desirable areas? Yeah, those days are probably long gone. Uh, you know, they used to be available. I just use a 10 because it's easy to do the math, and I'm not that smart. So you just divide it by 10, and it's pretty simple. <laughs> right. um, but, yeah, that those uh, anything, I think, pretty much across the country that would have a 10, uh, 10 cap today, uh, likely one is not truly a 10 cap. They're either um, under, they're most likely under sitting expenses or leaving something out of the operating expenses. Like say it's a small property and the guy uh, runs it himself and he fancies himself a handyman so he doesn't charge for his own time to go change out a garbage disposal or mow his own grass but when you go sell it in the open market the next buyer would, would factor that expense in their operating uh performance expenses uh, so that's one common thing or two it could be in the hood you know th those would be the two likely things and um you know buying properties in the hood is the surest way to get your you know your your clock clean that uh, in my experience mike talk about ways of getting your clock clean last time we had problems in your apartment business what were some of the reasons why we got our clocks cleaned if it's investment. Sure. Yeah, it's, being a being a banker through the last recession, the, the there's you know three or four kind of common themes that uh, I noticed what you know cause people to have issues and lose properties. Uh, you know, one like I mentioned is you buy a property in a in a high crime area, kind of buy in the hood. That's that's hard. Those are the properties that are you know the lower socioeconomic areas. So when you have uh, economic problems, those are the areas that get hit the worst. Uh, unfortunately, uh, two would be um, having uh, not putting capital into the deal up front, meaning that, like, like Paul mentioned, you know, we're big believers of putting the money up front. When you buy the property, you put aside an escrow account, cure, cure the issues right out of the gate uh, versus doing it in cash flow. Um, so what happens when you, you hit kind of a soft patch? sometimes your rent soften or you have to offer like a half a month or a free month worth of rent, kind of what we call rent concessions. And uh, if you don't have the money set aside for something and, you know, in Texas, it gets hot. So if you have like a, an occupied unit that has uh, is AC condenser go out, you go take a, a working condenser from a vacant unit, put it on your occupied unit, and now your vacant unit doesn't have an AC condenser and can't be rented. So then that kind of snowballs on you. So not having capital set aside on the front end is is an issue. Another one was um, poor management. So uh, like Paul mentioned, you know, like we had a lot of, or you mentioned, Bill, we had a lot of people from California come to Texas. So, you know, I can give you stories of UPS drivers that had a single 
single family house in Los Angeles that sold it and took a million dollars out and bought a small apartment complex in Texas um, back in 2006 or seven. Thought he could manage it from from California remotely and, you know, having poor management, not being on top of it, that that caused uh, issues. And then and then finally, just people having maturities at bad times. So, you know, we're big believers of putting, you know, today uh, still relatively low interest rates, putting long term fixed rate debt on, on loans and setting it out. 7, 10, 12 years out. So, you know, when you, if, if you have a, um, a down, a dip in the, in the cycle, you have many years left on your loan to kind of ride it out. Um, and if, but if, if you happen to have a maturity, say in 2009 and the capital markets were frozen, uh, your values had gone down, then the, the bankers to refinance your loan would have you to do a capital call and put more money in to lower the leverage of the loan. Um, and a lot of people just couldn't do it at that time because everything was hitting them. So uh, the people that had long term fixed rate loans that had maturities out past 2009. Uh, certainly were able to weather the storm a whole lot better than, than the ones that took floating rate loans at, at, uh, that, you know, had had call, short call, call maturity dates on them. Mm, yeah. What would you say now to a person that is, let's say they've got a number of small multi-properties, uh, you know, maybe duplexes, fourplexes, maybe eight units or something, and um, they're really they they really want to get in the 100 plus units um for somebody like that that's uh you know looking to uh, get into that marketplace uh what what do they need to have in place and what would you what would your recommendations be to that person uh to to move into that that level of asset uh, you know, I, I would think is like like I said before, real estate's like a team sport. So you need to kind of build your team out. Um, when you're going from when you go buy a duplex or a single family house, a duplex, a fourplex, usually the broker on the other side of uh, the transaction, the listing agent, doesn't care if you have previous ownership experience. Um, if you're going to go out and try to buy a hundred unit apartment complex, uh, they're not even going to show you the deal unless they understand who you are how you found it and try to try to assess your credibility out of the gate. Um, this is a, an unfair business, unfortunately, and a lot of it is uh, who you know and and uh, who's your team and what kind of credibility you have. So so first and foremost, you need to start uh, getting a team put together, um, you know, get you need to get educated. So if, if uh, you don't have previous uh, ownership experience in large apartment complexes, you need uh, there's there's many resources out there where you can go um, and, and learn how to do this. Uh, different different groups uh, can, can teach you how to do that um, that way. Uh, then secondarily, you need to make sure you you talk to a, a mortgage broker. Um, you know, Old Capital. Obviously, we, we do a lot of business, or or you know, one of our competitors that's that's competent in your area. Um, and make sure that that you they, they assess your your financeability because that that's just certainly one of the questions uh, any listing agent is going to ask is how are you going to finance it you know where's your money coming from where's your equity and where's your debt those are the two questions that you need to have answers for uh, and then finally make sure that you interview a good management team uh, third party management team uh, they also uh, that that are based in your your local area where you're looking to buy. They also will give you credibility that when you're you talk to the broker that so and so from my management company he has seen this deal and they manage a property a half a mile away. Th- those are good things to give you credibility with the Indian listing. Yeah, that, that transfer of credibility is a key component if you're moving from single family one to four unit properties up to fifty to a hundred hundred doors. Transfer of credibility. If you don't have it, you have to to get it. Uh, Michael mentioned education. That's probably. Uh, my number one thing is getting out there and getting educated. Uh, pay for a mentor uh, that actually is a hands-on mentor because you can make a, a $50,000 mistake in a blink of an eye, just like finding the wrong asset in the wrong area, uh, putting the wrong improvements to the property, listen to somebody that's actually been there, done that, like, you know, have them prove up uh, their educational system, what they've done for other people, listen and talk to those other people. But putting together your team, whether it is your attorney, uh, or your management company, or uh, you know, any any part of the group. That's that's an important piece because what we're looking for also is is when you uh, identify a property, and you want to go forward on the deal, and you you have maybe an accepted uh, letter of intent, uh, to in working your way to a, a purchase sale co- contract. We want you to make sure that you do a real good, thorough job, and having somebody do it to do the physical. Uh, uh, due diligence in the property, which we want somebody to take a look at the property, you know, as, as your eyes and ears, that they have a certain skill set, 
whether it is uh, putting camera uh, down the sewer line pipes to make sure there's no broken lines or making sure the electrical system uh, doesn't have any issues with overcapacity for everyone putting plugging their iPhones and their, their stereos and everything into the walls these days based on properties that were built in the 60s and 70s, making sure they can, can carry that load capacity, making sure the roof has been uh, reviewed, the parking lot's been done, making sure that everything, the physical due diligence has been eyeballed. So you know exactly what you're getting to what you're buying and a person who does uh, engineering or is a person that does single family is not a multifamily specialist so you can seek out a multifamily specialist that's a key person on your team that uh, is going to play a critical role to kind of determine what the costs are going to be up front to put to have us put that into the loan so you can cure those immediate needs on the property Great stuff. Um, when you mentioned the education part of it, give us an idea of educational organizations might be. In our area, there's two groups that we that we thoroughly recommend, uh, in, and they've been doing it for a long period of time. One is a group uh, it's based out of Houston, has operations in uh, Austin, San Antonio, and Dallas. But they're a national platform. They they do a, a, I think a daily radio show called Lifestyles Unlimited. Uh, there's probably fifteen twenty thousand members of that. Uh, they do a great educational mentoring uh, job. The other group is called Brad Sumrock. I think it's under bradsumrock.com. He's a Carnegie Mellon guy. He's on uh, thousands of apartments in the past. Uh, he's a great teacher mentor, and he offers a, a platform that uh, he'll teach you from the alpha to the omega uh, what needs to be done and how to avoid mistakes. He, he doesn't buy it with you, but he's just a, his passion is in, is in teaching. And you can look those two companies up on, on the uh, the internet, uh, but they are great sources for uh, you know for education, uh, and we do a lot of business with them too. So I'll put that out there too. So we, we do like those two companies, and but there's other companies around. There's there's real estate investment clubs in specific areas that you want to get involved in. Other things you want to take a look at is uh, maybe go to to meetups in your local area. Meetup, meetup, and it's kind of a, where people with similar ideas and attitudes want to get together and talk a little bit about whether it's rock climbing or square dancing, but there's ones for even commercial real estate and you know, try to feed off of that and try to build a little bit, maybe your team in that one. Uh, so we like meetups too. Can you give an example of a uh, situation where a loan applicant comes into you and, and really within the first five minutes, uh, and, and again, I'm giving maybe a, uh, just a, a, an ideal situation here, uh, you know that this person is uh, you know, going to be a great a great candidate for a loan um, and in their presentation and what they provide to you. Have you had those types of situations before? Yeah, we, we can size somebody up fairly quickly just based on their personal financial statement and what, what they know. Uh, you know, uh, we're not looking for, um, you know, we have no problems teaching people and telling them a little bit about how, how these transactions are structured. And so we like to, to have them have a little bit of base of knowledge before they come to see us or so. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about what we can do at the, the end of this program. But, uh, you know, we definitely like to see a strong personal financial statement, the net worth and liquidity and kind of your game plan and, and then figuring out a little bit about uh, who your team members are going to be to try to take, take down an opportunity that uh, you've uncovered. Uh, Mike, did you have anything similar? No, yeah, it's just it's a lot of it's about your your financial statement and how your your team is set up. And uh, if you don't have that, that's uh, one of the, the value add uh, propositions that we try to do to people that come to us that maybe only have a part of the part of the uh, equation put together. And then we can hopefully, if it's in the you know, markets that we serve, that we can hopefully help you get you know management company and or um, you know. Uh, the, the bank or insurance or whatever it would be or introduce you to some of the, the listing agents in our in our markets that we uh, that we know pretty well those are some of the things that we can kind of help um, put the pieces of the puzzle together we're going to find out what your level of knowledge is if you're in duplexes or fourplexes you're looking to make the jump up to 10 15 20 units uh, uh, we got to understand the backstory well first of all why you why you want to do this this you know what type of timing do you have do you want to try to do it yourself is this property do you live in uh, southern california and you're looking to, to make an investment in uh, uh norman oklahoma why are you doing that you know where where's your information on that area coming from have you been to the property you know tell us a little bit more about go in a little bit more detail not just because you saw it on LoopNet that it had a 10 10 cap to it and you, you want to invest in 10 caps uh, I want to hear the full story of what's going on. 
Sure. And uh, what what percentage of your applicants do you actually see? Or do you do most everything uh, you know online and uh, via the phone? We see probably about ninety nine percent of them uh, because we want them to. Uh, we want to build a relationship with them first. We want to you know, know the client is, is probably the biggest thing. Uh, you know, we will do transactions with people that uh, we've never seen or met before, but we want to make sure they actually physically walk the property. We'll probably walk the property with them. If it's in an area that you know, we can maybe jump on an airplane, go take a look uh, at a property with them, we'd be more than happy to do that. We'd rather do all this hard work up front in the deal, then come back and say, well, did you drive the property? Did you, did you go into detail with the client? Well, uh, you know, three to, six, three, week, three to six weeks down the road, and we have a, a problem. So we'd rather spend time, meet the client, be the property, talk with the management company, put the transaction together with the pro formas. And uh, it's not necessary for us to physically meet you, but, you know, like anything, you want to know who your banker is. You want you want to kind of understand who your who your client is. They want to know who the prop you know where the property is located at. We want to know the backstory of the transaction. Looking at the current market with the, the increasing interest rates, I know there's been a a, a bump you know since uh, Trump got elected. Uh, um, do you see that uh, trend continuing? Uh, it, it almost seems like it's been it's been held back for a number of years. And uh, uh, what, what's your what's your opinion on that and, and where it may be going? Uh, where it's going, I have no idea. It's, uh, <laughs> that's uh, that's always the tough part of the, about the business. It's a um, you know it's completely out of everyone's control, and but it does it does have uh, material impacts on on loan uh, loans along the way. You know, not only does it increase you know the cost to borrow, uh, some of these loans uh, when you when you're sizing them on like say a Fannie Mae loan in particular, a lot of these loans you're doing like twelve year loans. If your interest rate goes up, your cost of debt payment, your debt service payments go up, and then if your your ratios get out of whack, the way the lenders kill the ratios just by cutting loan proceeds. So, you know, we, we've had, you know, right now we sit the first, first part of December. Um, we've had transactions that we started, uh, you know, early November, and then that was before Trump, uh, before the election, and then now we're, we're dealing a little bit with the aftermath where some of the, the rising debt service uh, payments are cutting back some loan proceeds. So, you know, right now, as, as we talk, it's a little challenging um, as we, we currently sit because there's a little bit of uncertainty. Um, I would imagine we hit some level of certainty uh, after, after he's sworn in and, and we kind of calm down. But, you know, I don't know. I don't know if we're, you know, this is a temporary spike and it'll come back down or we're going to keep running. That's, that's a good question I, I don't have an answer for. And Fannie Mae loans are marked to the market. Which, which means that we don't only lock the interest rate in until the loan has been committed, and that's probably after five or six weeks after the loan has been processed, underwritten, appraised, and all the things that third parties are going to do. So Mike is correct, and so what happens is that right here at the end is that we're about to go try to rate lock deals, and interest rates have spiked up like 65 or 70 basis points from the day that uh, an application was taken that could have a material impact on the loan dollars. Now, on the reverse side, on the, on the banking side, you know, because those are loans that are based on deposit rates, they don't. That interest rate spike doesn't move through the market that quickly. It's kind of a the pig going through the python, so to speak. That's a very slow process. So we'll see interest rates rise on the bank side, but we may not see them for, I don't know, 60 days, 90 days or so. So interest rates that were available back in say October are still going to be available in November, December. So that's a real slow process. So, uh, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, who knows what's going to happen? You know, I, I, I really don't know. Any, uh, I mean, putting on your economist hat here, any projection on uh, how the Trump presidency will impact the commercial real estate uh, market in general? Interest rates will affect the market. So to the extent that he affects interest rates and rates go up, um, you know, I was we were discussing internally, you know, a, a bunch about, you know, a few months ago about what, you know, what a move in, a potential move in interest rate would be. And I, at the time, I thought we had about 75 to 100 basis points or, you know, three quarters of a point to a full point. 
and an increase that we can sustain in the 10-year treasury, which is most how, how most of these uh, loans are priced off of uh, before we see any material move upwards in cap rates. Um, but, I mean, we, we pretty much have taken the, the vast majority of that out, in my estimation. So I think if we continue to go up from this point, and like we say, we're interviewing, you know, you said this, doing this interview right now, the first day of December 2016. So if we continue to see rates go up, we'll have to at some point see the cap rates also go up, which basically in layman's terms means that pricing will, will go down. So you know the prices of these will go down. Um, what I think is going to happen uh, before that actually happens is, you know, I'm an owner of real estate. If I have it on the market to sell, you know, and a month ago I could have got a million dollars for my property, and now the rates are up, and the buyer's like, man, I don't get my same return because my interest rates are up versus what it was a month ago. They're just not going to pay my price. They're only going to pay 900000 for my property and I'm not going to sell because I think it's worth a million. So there's going to be a time where I think the transactions will, the transaction volume will have to like slow up until we have some level of price discovery in the market and the the sellers realize, okay, the everything's changed and that was that was that was then and now is now. Um, and that's not a easy flip of the switch thing. It, it takes a, a series of you know of, of no's and disappointments for the the owners when they're trying to sell it before they actually realize and discover that the pricing has moved um so how quick that goes i, I don't know you know and if the, if the rates drop right back down then you know it, it could just be kind of business as, as usual as we had it but it's it's gonna be uh, it's gonna be interesting uh you know one thing the markets don't like is volatility so if we continue to have some level of volatility i think it will slow up the the overall transactions uh in 2017 compared to 2016. do you only lend in texas no we lend uh, throughout most of the, the united states but you know lending commercial lending is almost like tribal knowledge we have uh Deep relationships, great knowledge in in Texas throughout the state of Texas, but we also lend in Arizona, you know, Nevada, Oklahoma, you know, all throughout the the, uh, the Southwest, uh, in Florida, and in other states. So uh, don't uh, give us a call if there's something that you know we can help you with. At least give it, we'll give you our advice. Right. And I, I've done this for for thirty three years, and I've closed four thousand loans. I mean. We, it's not, it doesn't hurt to just give us a call, and we'll, we can kind of lead you down the path if it makes sense or not. That's great. A lot of people listening are, are obviously interested in Texas. Uh, uh, just wanted to find out just uh, from you guys. You're, you're doing the loans. You're, you're, you're obviously very involved in the markets. Um, are there certain areas of Texas you, is, are, you know pretty excited about right now? I, I know that uh, – Michael, you're an investor, so you're obviously looking at uh, you know those those uh, hot places to go, and uh, maybe even those hidden gems uh, regions. And um, are there any uh, any still out there? I mean, there's still a lot of activity going on in Texas, but are there certain areas that look real promising? Yeah, this is kind of a, a tale of two cities, but. I- so we really have four four major cities here. Um, there's uh, there's uh, you know the four major metros in, in Texas are DFW where, where Paul and I are based, Dallas Fort Worth. You have uh, Austin, San Antonio, and Houston, and uh, they're they're very different markets. And and what uh, a lot of people headlines think of Texas, you think of oil. That really affects um, Houston. So Houston's had some economic issues over the last you know two two plus years now with the decline in the oil prices. Uh, so they've really uh, they were they're blown to go on building a bunch of units and that's you know all the new stuff has kind of stopped they're finishing it out and they're offering rental rental concessions on the multifamily products and their office markets a mess you know because they had a lot of oil jobs so so Houston's in, in a little bit of flux right now. Um, you know, San Antonio is kind of a slow plotting market. It's always just been kind of slow and steady with, with gradual growth. It seems to be that way. They have a lot of large corporate offices there and have a big military base, big military presence in, in San Antonio. So it's a pretty stable kind of plotting, boring market. But, you know, it, we, we do a lot of business in San Antonio and it's a pretty good market uh, down, down there. Um, Austin's been the high flyers, kind of like a little mini, mini California and Texas. 
right there. They have a lot of a uh, lot of growth. Um, the population just absolutely exploded over the last uh, decade or so, and they have a lot of uh, tech jobs. It's a much more liberal place. It's kind of a liberal part of Texas is right there in the heart of Austin. And then Dallas-Fort Worth, which we're based, is uh, the largest uh, metro area in the state, uh, the fourth largest in the country, I believe. And, you know, we have about 7.2 million people, very diverse economy. We have all these large uh, Fortune 500 corporate corporations headquartered here. We're we're constantly getting all these big corporate reloads from from your backyard, Bill, from California. Uh, the big headline over the last couple of years has been Toyota is moving the national uh, the U.S. headquarters from Torrance to uh, to Plano, Texas, which is about a mile or two from where I office actually, and they're moving 6,000 jobs with it. And if we can tell you story after story about big corporate relocations from California to to DFW, but we don't have any one industry here. Um, so all the all the more because in Texas, obviously I'm biased because I live here, but it, uh, it it's very diverse. It's got you know growth. You can still get decent values to rel- uh, income relative to the prices. So the yields on the properties are still still great. Um, you know the, the entire state has no state income tax, which is you know a huge advantage over states like California with uh, with 13 um, you know 13 percent top top tier for state income tax down in California. So there's there's a lot to like about the state, but you know definitely the, the areas that are concentrated in the oil which is primary houston and then you got midland odessa out in west texas those areas are suffering and the rest of the state is doing is doing pretty well what about the sub markets uh, you know towns like waco or lubbock uh, i mean are there any little sub markets that are uh, secondary markets? yeah the secondary yeah, markets kind of sound uh yeah the, 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 the secondary markets are, are definitely there um i don't know if paul has an opinion on some yeah we don't we we, we do some business we obviously loan in, in the, the secondary and tertiary type markets there's just not as much uh supply there there's just not that many people that live there so there's not that many buildings um and then you there you're a little bit more uh susceptible to uh, you know any any one company leaves a small town, a little bit more susceptible to have a, a downturn in that area. So uh, they, they tend not to be as attractive, uh, in particular for out of state investors, just because you know out of state investors want you know know of these major markets and the durability of the income streams a little bit a little bit more guaranteed in a major market because you have a lot of diversity. But Paul, do you have any thoughts on secondary markets? I definitely like secondary and tertiary markets. Uh, gets out a little bit out of the, the out of the mainstream. With, with a lot of investors say, I only want to lend or uh, invest in Dallas or, or or Austin, and they always forget about the the, the uh, secondary markets. Uh, but one thing to just remember is the properties that we're lending on. You know, again, we do more apartment loans than any, I would say, any apartment lender in the Southwest. Uh, it, these are properties that are, are as old or older than your demographic. These were built uh, in the, the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s. We're not uh, lending on institutional Class A properties. That's not what uh, investors that are, are buying these days, uh, the, the REITs are buying that type of stuff, but the individual or small family offices or the small syndications, they're buying properties that were built in the 60s and 70s with a value upside too. So. Now these are these are older older properties that have to be cured, fixed up, and uh, stabilized. Ah, great. Yeah, there's. Uh, I know a lot of people here are very interested in the North uh, Metro area and and some of those those uh, maybe secondary tertiary markets up there um, seem to be real, real appealing too. I think I could talk to you guys all day. This has uh, been really fascinating, uh, but I, I, I've got to respect your time and <laughs> let you guys go. One thing I want to mention here is that um, I received this information. There's a uh, it's called the Fundamentals of Multifamily Financing, and and it's a it's about a about a 15 page document. Um, I, I would rename it uh, myself multifamily loan cheat sheet because there's so much information in here for somebody that's ever thinking of applying for a loan. I mean, everything. I mean, you could think of. Uh, it's a great document. And uh, I understand uh, you guys are going to make this uh, available to those that, that want uh, want the information. It, it goes into not only does it talk about just a general overview of the multi uh, multifamily uh market, but it, it goes into real specifics about what you need to have when you go in for a loan application, you know, what they're looking for. I mean, just it's just a great, great piece. Uh, uh, but I understand you're going to make that available to our listeners. Is that correct? 
That's right. Yeah. If anyone is uh, interested in learning a little bit more about uh, apartment financing and how these deals get done, uh, if you just send an email to uh, info at oldcapitallending.com, that's info at oldcapitallending.com, uh, we'll reply back with the uh, what we call our white paper, our 15-page report. It kind of goes through the, the basic uh, – Basic uh, nuts and bolts of how how do how do these loans get done and like they give us a little little update on the market as well, um, and then we can also add you to our our we have a a weekly uh, email that we send out as a like a tombstone on some recent deals we've done and links to our podcast. Um, that's another good resource if anyone is interested in this. Uh, I like to kind of describe it. We have an apartment uh, a podcast for apartment nerds. Um, so if you're into uh, commercial commercial real estate and investing and things like that, the the old capital real estate investing podcast is on iTunes and Stitcher and Google Play. So if you just kind of put in Old Capital when you search for it, it'll be it'll be there. Or you go to our website, at oldcapitalpodcast.com. It's on there as well. Uh, we try to do weekly podcasts where we interview um, you know both both uh, vendors in the marketplace, like brokers, management companies, uh, etc. And then we have a lot of our clients on and kind of talk about uh, the transactions that they've done, the success stories, and kind of talk about general market updates uh, all the time. So uh, definitely. If, you, if you're interested in learning a little bit more and you, you like commercial real estate and apartment investing specifically, the Old Capital Podcast has a lot of uh, good, good, uh, good content around that. I'm a subscriber too. I, I can vouch for that. I particularly like the uh, so the testimonials of the folks that uh, have uh, purchased apartments. And I mean, you really go into some great detail there. They'll share their journeys as well, and uh, some of them are new buyers. And it gives you almost like the, the small town banker feel. You put people together and you connect people too. There's a lot of neat neat aspects of uh, Old Capital that uh, I would really recommend people listening to. Uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a big fan of your show. So. <laughs> that was the brainchild of Michael Becker. <laughs> <laughs> well, as if you guys don't have uh, uh, enough to do already, right? Oh, uh, mm. Well, um, gosh, you know, this has been really great. The uh, website, uh, you guys would have all that information there, or is there a, a number? Yeah, our, web, our website's oldcapitallending.com, oldcapitallending.com, or the other one's oldcapitalpodcast.com. And then I'll give you our main number, which is uh, 817-488-0440. And that's where uh, Paul's located. So if anyone has any questions, you certainly just you know reach out to us, and uh, we're happy to uh, talk about it. And if we, we can't help you specifically, we'll at least give you a little bit of advice and try to point you in the right direction. Oh, that's great. Well, thank you so much, you guys. Uh, you know, the, uh, we have a tradition here, as Michael already knows, <laughs> that uh, we ask our guests to uh, close out with their best old hound dog, Hal. Now, I know if you're from Texas, you guys know hound dogs. So uh, if you guys, uh, I've never had two guys, uh, you know, howl at the same time. So this is going to be a classic here. And uh, uh, it'll be going to posterity here as one of our <laughs> classic shows. So uh, if you guys are ready, I'm going to just say uh, one, two, three, and then how? Are you guys uh, are ready? Let's go for it. Yeah. All right. One, two, three. Oh. <laughs> that was great. Thanks, guys. Oh, man. Well, we Thanks, really, really appreciate your coming on. This has been great. Like I said, I'm a fan of your show, but you guys don't always get to talk. Uh, I don't, you know, people don't ask you questions. Uh, you're asking your, your guest questions. So it's, it's really nice to be on this side. Um, also, I uh, want to thank all of our old dog listeners out there for joining us today. I know there's a lot of things you could be doing right now, but the fact that you've taken the time to, to listen uh, means a lot to us. So many great appreciate it paul and michael thank you so much and i will uh, we'll be listening to your show and i hope those guys uh, will be uh, sending emails and getting that white paper uh from you too i think that's a that's a great thing to offer well that's a show for today uh remember cash flow is king and real estate investing the means until next time keep moving forward and may god bless thank you very much for visiting the old dogs rei network we would greatly appreciate if you would stop by iTunes and let us know what you think of the show. We would love if you could subscribe to the podcast, give us a five-star rating, and write a review. The more ratings and reviews we receive, the more visible the podcast will be to others. Thank you.